Guess what? <laughs> He's talking about desktop group. You have, yeah. <laughs> you have the floor. Hello, BotCon. Hi. Uh, desktop group, the saga continues. Um, that's me. Uh, you may have seen this slide before, so I just had to update the number of years. I've been working for Swiss Post for 17 years now. Uh, that's six years longer than BotConf has been around. Um, here are my BotConf speaker history. I try to be on stage every year, so um, since my CFP got rejected for a short talk, um, I had to do a lightning talk again. So we'll see about next year then. Um, desktop group, a uh, quick uh, timeline. I've uh, been talking about desktop group since 2018. And um, the group IB report was published in 20, November 2022. And uh, new since last year is uh, one of the key figures from desktop group has been arrested in Interpol Operation Irvone. And I hope you enjoyed the talk yesterday about operator, operator from Group IB and Orange. Um, you may have seen this slide before uh, in yesterday's talk. So in July last year, they announced that uh, one of the key members has been uh, arrested. And uh, in early June of last year. And so here are three dynamic DNS domains that we have seen being used since uh, September 2020. Uh, one in 2022, 2023 for Ave Maria and Remcos Rat, which we've heard also before. And um, some of them have been reused after the arrest of uh, one of the key members. So in August, uh, September, no uh, October of last year, uh, with Luminosity Link and SDR Rat and Async Rat. These are all from samples that we've done with discovered at Swiss Post. And so over the last uh, four months, I've uh, been collecting IOCs from recent attacks since after the arrest. I created a MISP event uh, shared with uh, Circle Lou, uh, distributed to all communities. It has uh, over 1,200 IOCs, um, 350 or more uh, related events. So um, you should be able to find this MISP event and look for those IOCs. And if you have a hit on any of those, um, get in touch with me. I'm still trying, trying looking for uh, more collaboration on, on the research group and uh, see if we can identify any more criminals and get some more arrests. So um, yeah, get in touch with me. Uh, come talk to me for the rest of the conference. And uh, let's get some more criminals arrested. Yes. So, hi everyone. So, today I'm going to talk about my end of study project, which is called C2 Active Monitoring, or um, how to collect, automatically collect samples, uh, orders, sorry, from common control servers by impersonating an infected machine. So, how it works, starting from the top left corner, we automatically collect samples from uh, well known malware databases like uh, virus total, malware bazaar, or triage. Then we store those, those samples and we extract their configurations. Then we have the C2 connectors, which is basically a set of Python classes, one for each uh, malware family that will uh, re-implement only the network communication parts of each malware family. So for example, it can be an HTTP client or a TCP client. So when we have a new NGRAT uh, configuration that will instantiate, for example, an NGRAT client class that will start communicating with uh, NGRAT uh, C2. So today we'll focus about NGRAT, which is a .NET RAT with a lot of features. So for example, you have the fan pop-up orders where you can play your piano on your victims. And uh, <laughs> you can also open their CD-ROM remotely or turn on and off their monitor. You can also, as an attacker, open uh, chat directly with your victims uh, in live. And so in my bots, when an attacker sends a message to me, I will respond it with like an answer, a question, sorry, 
like uh, what are you doing, who are you, or also some other question. So I'm going to talk about a threat actor, which is called I am Fury, based on his campaign ID. So he really wants to destroy my computer, as you can see in the message, like I will fucking kill your computer, getting your bank information, and so on. So he sends me like two exe file and an image. Uh, so the first exe is a wiper. The second is also another wiper. And the image is a fury, of course, <laughs> that I had to censor for obvious reason. And I also have a nice guy uh, which said, uh, you install a virus that uh, I did not distribute. And so he helped me uninstall the virus. So he even sent me uh, some documentation to uninstall NGRAT. So probably just he has just sent uh, his virus to virus total, so that's why I'm reaching uh, his uh, CD. And I have also a last uh, chat exchange, like who are you? So I'm a Russian student, so is there no obstacle at all, or is lying? And so he cannot hack my girlfriend account, <laughs> but he can help me uh, delete my virus. too much time on the furry. <laughs> Hi everyone. So this is CodeRex, generic regular expressions for code. So we reverse engineers write configuration extractors and we need to often locate code in malware samples. For example, we need to defeat encrypted stack strings, extract constants from the code, emulate instructions using Unicorn Engine, for example, and one of the best tools to do that is using regular expressions. So compiled code is very volatile and writing regular expressions manually presents many challenges. Uh, so for example, we cannot rely on the same registers being used. Also, the same instruction can be encoded in different ways as we can see uh, here. So as a result, your regular expression might require updates until it becomes more or less uh, stable, and that's also known as technical debt. So we see here some of, some, of some of examples from our production environment where we had to go back and modify those regular expressions, make them more generic, uh, etc. So uh, we've developed this tool called CodeRex, uh, which will help you generate generic regular expressions given a stream of code of either x86 or x64 instructions. And it was released during a workshop two days ago on conf configuration extractors. So you'll find more, more and more details on, on the GitHub page there. So it takes uh, a stream of input bytes, which, uh, which are assembled instructions. It will disassemble them using the ISED uh, engine, and then it will analyze the moving parts of this instruction. Uh, next, it will generate and assemble lots of permutations. Uh, so here we see that the stack uh, register was detected, so it's uh, substituting ESP as well as EPP to account for uh, some optimizations, as well as it's assuming a smaller as well as a larger stack frame. And in the end, it will output an optimized regular expression for you that you can use in your extractor. So here's the help menu. It accepts three arguments, the code, the address, start address of the code, and the architecture. And here's an example uh, that uh, generates a regular expression for two x64 instructions, uh, push RX and a call. And we see that the push was generalized to be for uh, a 64-bit register, and the call there uh, where the memory address was wildcarded. Uh, and so we've, we've uh, uh, taken some feedback from our work workshop and uh, uh, we're going to implement some new features. And if you see a bug and if you want something implemented, just feel free to reach out. Thank you. Hey everyone, my name is Kevin Hardy Cooper. I'm gonna get a jump on this. Uh, so I work for the Canadian Center of Cybersecurity uh, on the assembly line. Uh, <laughs> start the timer. <laughs> uh, on the assembly line project, I'm the dynamic analysis team lead for it. It's running. Um, it's running. All right. And then, uh, yeah, so I'm here to talk about assembly line. It's basically a way to supercharge your malware analysis uh, workflow um, at scale. So. Yeah, we built this tool, it's open source, and it's completely free, MIT license, so use it for whatever you want. Um, and it's on GitHub, and yeah, it's for 
incident response and detection teams or reverse engineering teams if you just want to automate um, any aspect of it, uh, of your workflow, you can plug an assembly line into the pipeline and submit files to it and have these custom little modules that you can run in order to just reduce the manual work and make it a lot faster. And also, it's open source, so we integrate a lot of different tools that are open source, such as Cape Sandbox, and we, t we work with uh, EML Parser and Leaf and Viper Monkey, also integrated into uh, the assembly line project. And yeah, there's a ton of different open source services that we have that uh, support a bunch of different high profile types that we see at the government of Canada, such as PEs, PDFs, Office documents. Archives were a big one with uh, Goo Loader and uh, CACBOT recently. And then we also have services for um, just plugging in any different uh, third party product that you have, like an antivirus tool or hash lookup. Um, if you, we have a Cape Sandbox uh, integration also. Our biggest deployment that we have with the government of Canada, um, it is deployed in the cloud and it scales up and down uh, based on the time of day. The government of Canada has great work-life balance, as you can tell by this graph. So there's a lot of files flowing uh, during the daytime and very little at night. And then so it's able to scale up and down for that. We have tons of different uh, static analysis and dynamic analysis tools. This is the 100-foot uh, view of, or 1,000-foot view of the scanning process. You have all these different files coming in. Uh, from a variety of different sources. You have all these different rule sets that you can plug in, like Sigma, Yara, or Suricata. Um, and assembly line actually recursively uh, submits files that are extracted. So if you have like a Word document that, uh, that has a macro, and then that macro will get popped out and then get reanalyzed by assembly line for a possibly VPS specific um, service. And then from there and there. Uh, and then from there, you get alerts that, are, that uh, can be uh, triaged by an analyst team. Uh, also, IOCs can be uh, indicated, and then there's some automatic tasking. And uh, no questions for this, obviously. Uh, something I do want to talk about is the MACO project that we have that we worked with um, in congruence with uh, the Australian CERT. And this is basically a way for um, malware config extractors to be um, kind of standardized, normalized into like a into a database ontology kind of method, and it's really easy for partnerships and sharing. And we love sharing malware extractors, and we would love to uh, work with everyone else uh, in order to facilitate that. And yeah, I think that's it. Thank you. Okay, uh, hello Botkov. Uh, I bring to you our team uh, work, uh, PowerShell LM, a little big uh, language model. Um, we search for a fast and reliable, re reliable detection tool of uh, malicious scripts into um, file systems that should be really fast. And uh, as uh, malicious scripts are usually versatile and uh, easy to uh, adapt, they can be used in different manners. Uh, in all steps of uh, kill chains by uh, threat actors. So we decided to work at the crossroads of uh, threat and, in and uh, artificial intelligence. Um, we set our sights on a pre-trained engine called Star Encoder, that is a small LLM encoder. Uh, then we fine-tuned it with a small labeled data set of 700 PowerShell scripts, that is uh, pretty small in the world of uh, deep learning. And uh, we, use, we, we choose uh, PowerShell as it's uh, already largely used by three actors. And uh, after the first uh, training of our model, we evaluated it uh, with the learning data set itself. And as you can see, uh, the results are pretty good after uh, fine tune. We wanted to improve our model efficiency and that's where the real deal uh, starts. Uh, we choose uh, to analyze some of the scripts and then choose to keep or change their labels or simply uh, delete the samples if needed. After some uh, analysis of uh, false positives and negative scripts, we found that uh, some of uh, them were not correctly labeled, so we decided to move them. Um, here are two scripts that were labeled as malicious and they are parts of the PowerShell Empire framework. But uh, if used on their own, they are not malicious. And that is the gray side, I think. Uh, what is your definition of a malicious script? Uh, what do you expect from a tool that must detect malicious script? Uh, 
Should it detect the safe invoke voice troll.ps1 as part of a malicious framework? We don't expect our model to work as a signature engine in our case. We expect it to tell if a script is malicious or not. We cannot force it to identify as malicious files that are not. For me, the samples will simply be deleted from data set. And uh, then, here it is. Uh, we increased our model efficiency. The samples that we reclassified or removed deg degraded our model. So we have now a little but very strong malicious partial scripts uh, detection model. Um, after this little demonstration, we can afford that uh, curating data sets and adapt the use case is uh, mandatory to increase the model efficiency. And it will depend on what you really want to detect uh, in your networks, unhealthy or malicious files. So uh, I'm not saying that it uh, covers all cases of detection, but it should be considered as a very precious complementary module with others to reduce holes in malware detection. Hey, Bakonf. Have you ever opened up a NIM sample only to think, like, maybe life isn't worth living like this? <laughs> maybe I can help. So NIM, programming language, it's used a lot for open source projects. Maybe you've seen this one. It's been used for Crimeware, too. And some APTs, like Mustang Panda. To show you how weird it is before I get into the tool, this, all the yellow boxes, they're the same variable. So it's kind of a mess even on the language side. But once you compile it, it's a whole other thing. So first, all the identifiers are mangled. But of course, it's not going to be the same thing as C++. Nothing standard, nothing documented. It's its own thing. So this is an actual name from a backdoor. Doesn't really make sense. And this is another one. It's even worse, barely readable. But once I read through the source code, I figured it out. And that's much cleaner. But then there's a whole second mangling scheme for init functions because of reasons. And if you clean it up, it's still not great, but you have more valuable information in there. So uh, paths that are revealed can reveal information about threat actor. Then there's, there are the strings, weird ass variable names uh, that my tool helps with. And Ida doesn't even see it as a string. But I won't bore you with all the details. Just we released the tool on GitHub. It's under the BSD2 clause license. Uh, please open up issues, pull requests, and maybe you'll finally not be so afraid of NIM. Thanks. <laughs> It's going to be fast. Uh, where is it? Something. OK. No. no. <laughs> Seems OK now. No, no, no. Okay, uh, so I'm, I'm a moral analyst. I'm also a police officer, Brazilian Federal Police. Uh, and now I work at Interpol as the head of the Cybercrime Intelligence Unit, so very long. This photo, of course, is from COVID times. Uh, so I'm here to talk about Brazilian banking malwares. They are very prevalent. We have them since 98, and it's been quite a journey, and I've been uh, doing most of my reversing on this. Uh, in 2017, we did the first operation that was based on an analysis of a malware sample. So we, we managed to identify the operator uh, analyzing the malware. It was a very difficult case because 
And most of the infrastructure was outside in, in Canada, and we couldn't get the, the whole thing. But we arrested the operator, I got the console, and then uh, two years later, I, we arrested the developer. The picture is the guy trying to turn off his computer. That didn't work, but the computer was encrypted anyway, so that was an issue. Uh, so this is a remote access Trojan. We call this uh, Kaili Himata. This isn't the name that the guys use. Uh, I don't have time for this video. Probably it's, it is not playing. So I, if you want to see this video, you can ask me later. Uh, so after this, we had an international expansion. And this is a, a page from Kaspersky. They showed a lot of, of uh, families. All of these families are from Brazil. And then the antivirus stopped classifying the families as Brazilian banker, and they started to use different names. Of course, different antivirus use different names. So we have one from ESET, a very good friend called Jakub, that from ESET, he presented this here in 2019. And you can see the names are all different. This is very confusing for us. But we were very lucky that one particular name was the same for all the antivirus Grandoreiro. And this name is like this because they stuffed the payload with a four, 400 megabyte BMP. So you can't submit this to VirusToto. It has a very big chain of infection. And this was a case why I was transitioning to Interpol with Brazil and the Spanish National Police because the victims were there. And we did an operation uh, this year. Uh, this guy on the back with the Interpol jacket is me. Yes, I traveled from Singapore to Brazil. No, I don't travel business. A lot of jet lag, but it was, was worth it. And uh, now we are building our own malware uh, lab. And if you have any tips for us, we'll appreciate it very much. And we do monitoring for the Grand Dorado samples. A lot of domains, a lot of C2s, they rotate very fast. And we are pushing this to the MISP instance. So thank you very much. All right, what's up everyone? Uh, today I'm gonna talk about why Turtle loves dumplings so much. Uh, this is me on the left. Uh, I did this research together with Daniel Bunce. Uh, he's the guy that made Zero to Automate it. Uh, I like reverse engineering, Turla equation group, all of that. I work in the national security team and for time considerations, I'm gonna move on. Uh, Pilmeni, uh, it's the Russian word for dumpling. It's basically a loader employed by Turla, which is allegedly the 16th center of the FSB. Um, yeah, they, they, they use the loader to drop casual, which is a highly documented uh, payload they use by now. And what you would usually see is that there is a DLL dropping casual um, and the DLL being Pelmeni. Uh, they employ uh, some vendor names like Brother, Asus, uh, NVIDIA uh, in the program files. There are already some public IOCs available made by the people of Lab52. If they're in the crowd, I love you guys. Um, <laughs> And uh, we just did some more research on what they did, uh, pivoted and found some uh, samples that were not documented yet publicly. Uh, don't have to type this over, there's a QR code at the end which you can scan. Uh, but there are still some questions left for us as to what is happening. Um, the C2s that were connected by the casual payload, which were dropped by Pelmeni, uh, are usually uh, compromised WordPress websites, which is Schoolbook APT. Uh, Though we still want to know how uh, the actor in question is connecting to the victim facing C2s, whether that's through uh, a covert C2 channel perhaps, or if there's a bastion host somewhere. Um, also the initial access factor, how Pelmeni in the first place was dropped is still unknown to us. And we also don't believe that there's, this is like the only uh, casual dropping that they employ. Uh, we suspect that there is a fallback beacon somewhere in this chain and we are looking to identify that. So if you have any uh, ideas or answers to the questions uh, listed before, feel free to contact me and the IOCs mentioned can be uh, copied from the QR code. So yeah, that's it. Don't go too far. So at, at the end of all the presentations, I will ask all the li lightning talk participants to come back. <laughs> uh, you're 12, right? Yeah. AI. We had to have AI. For sure, yeah. 
So hi everyone, my name is Fabian, I work for Deutsche Telekom Security and I'm going to talk quickly about using AI for cyber threat intelligence. So um, suddenly I, AI everywhere. Um, since G GPT has arrived, everybody is like super hyped about the topic and naturally a lot of cybersecurity vendors uh, picked that up and started talking like, yeah, our products are AI powered, whatever that means. And um, I feel a little bit that we skipped the step where we actually ask ourselves where can AI actually help us? So which tasks do we want to leave to an AI? For sure there's a lot of tasks, but let's talk about it. And I thought like, I'll pick one thing that we are working on right now. It's very much a work in progress. We are um, currently evaluating multiple use cases in the area of processing threat intelligence reports. Obviously as a threat intel analyst, you have to read lots of things New reports coming out, malware analysis, um, descriptions of threat actors, and so on. And so, whenever we can, like, um, un, uh, yeah, help with this process, maybe it's uh, worth looking into it. So, um, there's uh, like three uh, different examples um, which uh, we are currently looking into. So, one is named entity recognition. Um, so, basically, what it's what it can do for you is to, like the name says, um, extract like names of malware, names of threat actors, um, affected products, and so on, um, can be used for like um, tagging or uh, categorization and so on. Um, text summarization, like the name indicates, um, very long reports, you get a short summary, um, can decide if it's worth reading the whole report. And then retrieval augmented generation, if you have a corpus of, of data, basically, it can get the relevant data and then uh, you can do basically Q&A uh, like a chatbot. So if you never worked in that area and ask yourself, where can I start doing uh, this kind of stuff here, two recommendations, Hugging Face is basically a large database of um, free to use AI models, very cool, they have a Python library that allows you to use that in minutes, gets started in minutes. Um, if you are a little bit more advanced trying to build like AI powered applications, then maybe a lang chain is uh, worth looking into. We're currently evaluating this. And basically the idea is that you can create uh, more complex applications from rather simple modules and chain them together. So um, I'm looking for people who are doing something similar and maybe want to exchange like what does work, what doesn't work. So um, I forgot to put my contact details, I noticed now. But you know my face now, so you can come talk to me anyhow. Thank you very much. I got AI as well. Ooh, that's a lot of people. Uh, hi everyone, and uh, today I'm gonna present to you some things that we have been observing recently uh, with fake uh, LinkedIn profiles being created uh, recently. So, some C-level employees within uh, a redacted company that is definitely not present on the slide um, have been contacted by very strange uh, LinkedIn profiles. Uh, if we looked a little bit into it, this employee was not found into the internal database uh, and uh, had a verbative and very, um, and very uh, approximate translation of Capgemini's uh, slogan. So it's part of our interest. Um, so we looked deeper into the, into the profile. Um, the picture seems very, very uh, AI generated. Uh, please don't hit me for using AI. Uh, has a translation of Capgemini slogan, and the uh, same goes for the about section. Always start with uh, hello, I am. Uh, uses random emojis and uh, very generic and uh, very, um, very vague description of the of the person's activity. So, this one is obviously a fake, uh, but. Question, of course, uh, is there more of those? Uh, so we used a very simple tool, actually, 
uh, sometimes simpler is better. And uh, using a uh, recruiter light uh, account trial, we filter by the current company, the education. Uh, so we focused our research on HSC and uh, Ecole Polytechnique, which are two very prestigious French schools. Uh, and we filter on LinkedIn account creation of less than three months ago. And uh, so for uh, just uh, a specific company, we had 10 profile funds, and for a um, broader um, broader scope, uh, we had like 200 uh, new accounts in the last three months if the company filter removed, uh, all bearing the same features, so which had a perfect profile pictures, uh, verbatim and poor translation of, uh, of companies. Sorry, I put Cap Germany, but uh, this is wrong uh, slogans, uh, and the same vague job description. Uh, so they joined LinkedIn less than three months ago. And uh, for someone who has a 10 year plus of experience, uh, I don't believe that people hear about LinkedIn just three months ago. We have handed uh, this information to LinkedIn, some profiles are still active, and uh, several big companies are affected by this, uh, by this activity. Uh, it's unclear why, so I've, I'd be curious if you've heard about it. Uh, please feel free to, to come talk to me. Maybe it's uh, the start of a new campaign, a new disruption campaign, malware distribution campaign. We have seen, seen that in the past. Uh, yeah, please come and find me if you have more information. Thank you. Hello everyone, I'm Daniel Nisi, and in these three minutes I will try to uh, summarize our recent work that we conducted at Euregon on uh, Android malware um, evasion and how to counter it. So I think we can all agree that malware is getting more complex and uh, dynamic analysis is uh, um, getting very prominent uh, in Android. Our experiments show that 68% uh, of malware um, exhibits some evasive behaviors. So far, the community has done a great job in documenting uh, evasion techniques, but so far the information is very scattered. For this reason, we um, uh, performed a systematic study, a study of uh, evasion uh, in uh, Android malware, uh, which is about to appear in uh, Asia CCS in July. Uh, in this study, we surveyed blog posts, paper, talks, and other sources, and uh, we came up with a taxonomy of over 50 evasion techniques and we provide proof of, of, proof of concept implementation for all the survey techniques that we implemented in a tool that we called Alcazar, like with two A's, um, sort of Alcazar for Android. This can come very handy if you have a sandbox that you develop and you want to test if it's resilient to um, dynamic analysis evasion. It's available on GitHub, so feel free to check it out. So, um, since it seems it's very difficult to, um, so uh, basically we use this tool uh, to test all the sandboxes that are connected to VirusTotal. So we uploaded a modified version of uh, the tool that sent back the um, result of the uh, evasion attempt to our, uh, an endpoint that we, con that we control. And we discovered that all the sandboxes connected to VirusTotal were positive to at least one evasion technique that we implemented. Since it's uh, so difficult to um, implement a, a resilient Android malware um, sandbox, we uh, decided to come up with a recipe uh, for the perfect uh, Android malware sandbox. And for us, basically, you should never use any user space framework like Frida Exposed or anything like that because they, int they introduce way too many um, artifacts that malware can exploit. So you should always do everything in the kernel side and you should mitigate evasion techniques by uh, feeding malware with uh, uh, tampered data. Um, we actually implemented this uh, uh, recipe in a uh, sandbox that we call Droid Dungeon, uh, which was able to detonate 92% uh, of uh, uh, Android malware in the virus total feed. Um, we also implemented uh, this feature in uh, Droid Dungeon, so API syscall tracing, app introspection, memory introspection, including recovering Java objects. We also recover uh, TLS secret, uh, to decrypt um, uh, network communication and also other monitor or other crypto operation. And stay tuned for when we will launch our online service based on Droid Dungeon.
All right. So this is going to be uh, an even shorter lightning talk compared to some of the other lightning talks. I got four slides, so I don't think I'm going to need all three minutes, but we'll see. So what I want to talk about uh, are tips from, for Ghidra. Uh, I know a lot of people use it, and I felt that one of the things that what I could contribute back to what I learned from the community is to share, well, tidbits and snippets. Uh, so I have, well, my nickname, right, Libra, uh, my own Ghidra library to a certain extent, uh, which was inspired by the, uh, well, work from Igor Skoczynski, if I do pronounce that correctly, uh, from Hexray, uh, who posts, well, one tip a week and has done so for uh, a lot of weeks in a row now. Now, my goal here is not to just share a piece of code or a piece of text, but what I want to do is I want to explain the what, why, and how. Right, because then you can use it in your own project later on and well, make it more versatile and more usable. So my plan is to have one tip a month and to provide well, building blocks for you uh, for any use case, really. So leaving the URL up in case you want to uh, visit it. There are three tips currently online. The dark theme for Ghidra, obviously, right? Uh, how to make sure that you don't have to use your middle mouse button anymore to select the, uh, the variables in the decompiler. Um, <clears throat> and some more generic information on the, uh, well, more recently released bSIM uh, or binary similarity uh, that they've released, well, I think day before Christmas, right? Some, some light Christmas reading material, if you will. So there's more to come um, in about three weeks. So that's it from my side. Thank you. I, I don't know who's tutoring those uh, uh, students, but um... <laughs> okay. So this all started a few days ago when my colleagues told me, hey, you should do a lightning talk at the PodConf. Okay, so sure, why not? And then one of the staff members who's also a colleague said, no, you can't show honeypot logs. So now I had to find something else. So I wrote a decryptor for a ransomware this morning at 4 a.m. Um, so I'm Aris, I'm a malware analyst. I slept two hours, so I'm sorry. Uh, as it turns out, uh, making slides is time consuming. So why a ransomware decryptor? Because I've always wanted to write one. So I searched for ransomware on Google, found a Python one, that's great, easy to reverse engineer. So I downloaded it and ran it to see what it did. So it dropped its uh, ransom note, and then a few minutes later, it encrypted its ransom note. So, oh boy, okay, great. <laughs> so as, it, as I said, this ransomware is written in Python. So well, it's packaged, packed with uh, PyInstaller. So those are the steps to get the source code back, or part of the source code back. So that's some of it. And as you can see, it's really well commented. That's kind of suspicious. So right click, look up on Google, and of course, it's based on an open source ransomware, which is nice. I don't have to reverse engineer it anymore. And the one on GitHub uses a fixed key, but it's based on Linux. And by scrolling through the source code on the one that I had, it also uses a fixed key. So yeah, just needed to slap that in some repurposed code and I have a decryptor now and a lightning talk, hooray. And since I have time left, I will be doing a live demo on Eric's PC. Thank you, Eric, of the letter. Of the letter. Hello everyone. Um, I'm going to talk about quickly, very quickly about Active Directory. It's a very juicy target for any attacker. So let's quickly go through and try to find out what's going on. So I'm working as Offensive Security Director at FTI Consulting and I wrote a book about pen testing Active Directory and Windows based infrastructure. Well, this is not really interested. Um, so here, uh, what are we going to discuss? So I will focus on Active Directory as it's limited time. For others, exchange, like use and pray until the new bomb will arrive on the internet if you have it on premise. 
uh, certificate services um, run all available tools to check whether you are good with that. Check one more time, another time, and another time, and there will be still vulnerabilities there. SCCM and SQL, well, Microsoft, leave it to you alone with that. Read the documentation, try your best. Look for impersonation in SQL. So Active Directory, this is key areas which can help you to stop the attacker from doing anything bad. So tiering, read about what is zero trust, how it works, what are the actual recommendations. Try it your own and see whether it will work for you. Authentication, okay, we have NTLM still everywhere there. There are known fixes like SMB signing, LDAP signing and other things. If you will be able to successfully implement it, there is a Guinness book, you can apply it, probably you get yourself a page there. Kerberos extension, easy, straightforward, tickets here, tickets there. When it comes to the extension, it becomes more and more difficult and you start having like really nasty things like diamond tickets, subfire tickets, different type of delegations and things like that. Delegation, well, if we speak about delegation, there are some things which supposed to work, documentation is very limited, yeah, it doesn't work really, so you will have troubles with that anyway. So breaking RDP, users complaining. Coerced authentication is also there and it will be with us probably till the end of Windows, so till the end of the world probably. Um, not gonna be fixed anyway, so something need to be care to be careful. Yeah, password management. If you have like if you implement LAPS GMCA, this probably gives you some good uh, defense against Kerberosing, for example. Detections look at MDI and think about implementing it as it can help you with different level of success, but still better than nothing. Administration limits your, what your user are running with a Windows Defender application control. It's very good, especially think about file runtime uh, rule. JIR, limit your administrators as well. No need to add the first line tech support guys into local admin group. Endpoints, RMC, ETV, Defender, uh, attack surface uh, reduction, everything is there. Uh, VDAG is dead now, so. Yep, yeah, that's it. Yeah, you had a hundred more slides. <laughs>